Hey guys, welcome back to Founders Talk. Today we're partnering with Eugene Thrasingham LLP and we'll be going through three scenarios regarding co-founder disputes. I'm Rachel, I'm a corporate lawyer. And I'm Swang, I'm a disputes lawyer. On the first scenario, 50-50 tragedy. There may be times when startups have two co-founders, both of whom hold 50% shareholding and both of whom are directors. This is all wonderful and nice until you face a fight or quarrel or disagreement. In such a situation, you find yourself placed in a scenario whereby the company can neither move forward nor backwards. It's time like this when I tell my clients to look for Swang. So Swang, in these cases, what would you advise people to do? In a true deadlock situation, there are really only two options available to you. The first and the more encouraged option is for parties to engage in amicable discussions to try to come to an amicable settlement where parties agree on the terms and conditions of a clean break and hopefully to enter into a binding settlement agreement. Unfortunately, there are situations where parties are unable to settle their differences. And then the second option arises, which is that you may consider going to court to try to force a buyout or to even get the company wound up or closed down. And from a cost and time perspective, how long do these disputes typically take to resolve? If parties are really serious in engaging in without prejudice discussions, I have seen cases resolved within two to three weeks. In situations where parties truly want to fight every single situation, then uh, it goes to possibly six months or even a year. So from a corporate perspective, we do advise some of our clients to enter into a co-founder agreement that sets out clear mechanisms when these situations do arise. One mechanism that parties have is for one co-founder to have a veto right over the other, hence setting out who is clearly the boss, or the second mechanism would be to have a buyout mechanism where if parties disagree, they can buy each other out either at a discount to the fair market value or the fair market value of the shares itself. Next, we move on to the situation whereby your co-founder kicks you out. While you may think that this is a remote possibility, but we have seen this happening before where our friends or our clients call us up and say, hey, we woke up one day and we received a WhatsApp, email or notification saying that, hey, my co-founder no longer wants me in my company. It's like being served divorce papers out of the blue. In such scenarios, Swang, what would you advise our friends to do? Don't, in the heat of the moment, send WhatsApp, send emails, send angry letters because anything that you do or say will be used against you in court. My second advice is to calm yourself down and start to retrieve all the important documents, your contracts, your term sheets, your WhatsApp communications, your email chains. Look through all these important documents to find out whether the other side's accusations have any basis. Third would be to prepare a simple table of chronology. This helps you with refreshing your memory and again helps you to find out if what the other side says is true. Yes, and often when founders or startups go through such a situation, it could be highly stressful. We would encourage our friends and startup founders to go through some form of counselling. Oftentimes, you may be in a better position than you think you really are in. In a third scenario, you could be subject to minority oppression. What does that mean? While sometimes you are not the lead co-founder, you could be the CTO holding 30% shares, or you could just be a co-founder whom you know is not in a, such a strong position. Then you wake up one day and you find out that your colleagues have been holding meetings without you, they're making decisions without you, and you feel that you no longer have a voice in this company. <laughs> now, when you face such a situation, what should you do? Well, again, there are two possible options. The first option is for you to consider whether you have a claim in minority oppression. Minority oppression, as the name suggests, is where the majority uses their power to act in a manner that is prejudicial or unfair to your interest, even if they are entirely empowered to do so. So this reminds me of a case of mine where the company involved was a company selling birds. My client was a minority shareholder of that company. Then what happened was the majority shareholder first removed her as employee and then they had a meeting to remove her as a director. Subsequently, they tried holding meetings to wind up the company so that they could move the business to another company in which she was not shareholder. And when that didn't happen, uh, they held another meeting to try to reduce her percentage shareholding in the company. Another scenario is where the majority outrightly harms the company. 
Simple example, maybe where the majority sets up a competing business and then diverts this company's business to the competing business. In such a situation, you as minority shareholder may have the right to apply to court for permission to commence a derivative action in the company's name against the majority. Well, from a corporate perspective, what we would encourage startups to do would be to put in protective mechanisms in their shareholders' agreement or constitution. One protective mechanism could be in the form of a reserve matter where the company cannot take certain actions unless you agree with it as well. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share and comment below and let us know what you would like to know more about next. You can find me on LinkedIn at Rachel Wong and Swang everywhere because he's famous. <laughs> and until we see you next time, take care and stay well.